The following program is a UWTV classic. University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marcia Alvar. Temple Grandin was born autistic, a neurological condition she has likened to viewing the world through a kaleidoscope while trying to hear a radio station jammed with static. Trapped inside this sensory overload are individuals estranged from human emotion but sometimes gifted with rare talents, like the character in Rain Man that Grandin helped Dustin Hoffman shape for the screen. In her 1986 autobiography, Emergence, labeled autistic, Grandin shared her remarkable journey from the fearful isolation of her childhood to her life today as one of the world's leading designers of livestock handling facilities a talent that stems from her deep sense of empathy with animals. Grandin's newest book is Thinking in Pictures and Other Reports from My Life with Autism. And welcome to Upon Reflection. It's nice to be here today. I wanted to have you begin by talking about your work, what's involved with designing a livestock handling facility, and, and maybe do it by having you describe one that you, you write about extensively, and that is The Stairway to Heaven. Well, I've uh, worked for the last 20 years with the uh, meat industry on improving uh, humane treatment of animals at meatpacking plants. And one of the first projects I ever did was in a meatpacking plant, and we called that project the Stairway to Heaven. And that's something I, I do with a great amount of respect you know, for the animal. In fact, while I was in college, I had a roommate who was blind, and uh, Gloria came and visited the meat plant, and she helped write a very nice uh, uh, plaque that we put on the wall in the plant and it said the stairway to heaven is dedicated to those people who desire to learn the meaning of life and not to fear death. You through respect for the animals can come to respect your fellow man as well. You know and I feel very strongly about you know treating animals humanely. We owe animals a decent life and you know there's things out in agriculture that need to be improved. And what what are the aspects of the designs that you do that make the handling more humane? Well, first of all, you use chutes that are curved, so the cattle can't see what's up ahead. And the thing that the cattle are the most scared of is seeing people moving around up ahead. And the real interesting thing is, is the things that scare cattle are the same things that, that bother autistic children. Uh, when I was a little kid, loud noises hurt my ears like a dentist drill. Scratchy petticoats uh, felt like sandpaper. Um, sudden change caused a fear reaction. These are the same things that bother cattle. I found in working with the plants a high-pitched noise upsets the animals. Something that goes ch -ch -ch and hisses upsets the animals. And anything that looks out of place upsets them. If you leave a coffee cup on the floor, they won't walk over it. But I designed all my chutes so they'd be curved, so they don't see the people moving around up ahead. That's one of the things that I'm most scared of, is seeing people and motion. And then I also worked on designing a conveyorized system for holding the cattle. So that they, they move... That's smoothly right. See, cattle is an animal that naturally will walk in single file. You know, and, and, and a lot of people ask me, well, do the cattle know they're going to get slaughtered at the meat plant? They don't know what slaughtering is. If you go to a meat plant and you very, very carefully observe, the things that scare the cattle is something silly like a plastic juice bottle fell off a catwalk onto the floor, a uh, high-pitched noise, a train going by the plant. Mm -hmm. Seeing something. Seeing something. Like what, one time I was over at a plant and a train went by. That really freaked out the cattle because it was sudden, jerky movement. You mentioned that your own experience as, a, as an autistic person, one of the, the skills, the talents that, that's helped you uh, in this profession, what are the other skills, qualities well, you have? Many autistics and also quite a lot of dyslexic um, uh, children and adults are visual thinkers. I think totally in pictures. And in my new book, Thinking in Pictures, I, I discuss that. Um, all thoughts are in pictures. 
I don't think in a, in a linear sort of way. When I think, I make a lot of associations, and I see pictures in my mind, like video. Like, for example, let's say you asked me to access my memory on church steeples. I don't see a generalized generic one. In fact, I was rather shocked to find out that most people just get this sort of generalized fake one. I see individual church steeples that I can identify and recognize, like the church I went to as a child, the church that's at you know bottom of the hill next to my house. They are specific ones. It's like a card file or yeah, a that's library. Right. All of my thoughts go from specific to general, not the other way around. Now, visual thinking is a great asset for an equipment designer because I can actually test run equipment in my head, like virtual reality in my head. And when somebody asks you to design a facility, the way you've described the way that you design them is it really happens in your head and you see it almost from above. You can, well, you can I visualize can, it. I can view it from above. I can view it. What would it look like from the cattle's perspective? You know, what would it look like if I, you know, was cleaning the facility? You know, I can view it from any, any perspective in my mind. And as I draw the drawing, the facility gets, you know, clearer and clearer in my mind. How did you connect? with cattle, how did you develop the empathy you have? Not well, just with cattle, but with other herd animals as well. Well, see, the nervous system of a herd animal is a lot like a lot of the problems I had due to immature brain development. They found that autism is immature brain development, especially in the limbic system and the cerebellum. And the same things that hurt my ears and scared me are the same things that, that bothered the cattle. And one of the primary emotions in autism is fear. And of course, that's going to be one of the primary emotions in a prey species animal like cattle. You know, I'd get a loud noise that hurt my ear. It also set off a great big fear reaction. And this is due to the immature neurological development. Does that mean that, that if somebody asked you to design a facility for predatory animals, that you wouldn't be able to approach it the same way? Well, I'm, I've learned a lot about animal behavior, and I'm a, I'm a good observer, and, and uh, you know, I. I don't empathize with them the same way I do with prey species animals like the cattle, the antelopes. I've worked with the um, Denver Zoo on training the antelope at the zoo to cooperate with their veterinary procedures. This is a very flighty animal, and a lot of people didn't think it would be possible to train an antelope to voluntarily allow you to take a blood test from it. And this greatly improves the welfare of the animals because they can do things like blood testing and injections and shots and examinations without having to uh, shoot the animal with a tranquilizer dart. It's a, it's a great description in your book because one of the things that I learned from your work is that they're really very crafty. You know, they, they know what's, uh, what's coming and they know how to get the treat as you're working with them to, uh, to train them to be, to be examined and to well, be Well, first of all, you use the treats to uh, train the animal to go into a box and you have to very carefully on um, accustom the animal to all the novel sounds it's because novelty scares a prey species animal so you have to introduce novelty very slowly and carefully and one of the things the animal had to learn to tolerate the doors opening on this box so we train them to go into a box shut the doors then while we're throwing treats in there uh, do the examination on the animal and 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 if you just all of a sudden just pull the door up and the animal wasn't used to it they'd spook and of course, the flighty animal like antelope, that could be very disastrous if they spooked and, and hit a wall. So you have to very slowly and carefully introduce them to those sounds. Hmm. But then once you get them trained and they're no longer scared of the sounds, then they learn, well, maybe she'll still give me the treats even if um, I kick. So you can get a situation where they might you know, kick the injection out of your hand. So then you have to teach them, well, you don't get the treat until you stand still. <laughs> One of the other breakthroughs or, or doors in a series of doors that you describe opening uh, in your life was one that involved a way that you were able to get the feeling of a hug um, and it's a machine. Can you talk about the well, squeeze you see, machine? You see, one of the problems in autism, you know, with the sensory oversensitivity is I want, you know, being touched hurt. You know, when people hugged me, it was too overwhelming. It was like a tidal wave of stimulation just washing over me. You know, I wanted to feel a nice feeling of being held, but it was just too overwhelming. And, and when I was a little kid, I used to get under sofa cushions, get under mattresses. In fact, many autistic kids will seek pressure by getting under mattresses. But when I got into puberty, I started having these horrible anxiety attacks, and I was desperate for relief. 
And I noticed out in my aunt's ranch that when the cattle went into the uh, squeeze chute for their vaccinations, is when the pressure was applied to hold the animal still, it, that sometimes they, they would relax. And so I built this device I could get into that applies pressure that helped, you know, it also helped me to relax. I've described the machine to a number of people and every single one of them would love to get into this machine. There's something very universally appealing about the idea of a machine that, that you can have hug you. That's right, and, and most people that try it um, find it relaxing. Uh, back when I did my master's thesis in college, um, I found that about 60% of the students uh, definitely found it relaxing. Obviously, there were some people that were claustrophobic and they didn't particularly like <laughs> it. But most people uh, found the pressure was relaxing. And the thing that's interesting is the way an animal reacts to pressure is very similar to how a person reacts. Slow, steady movement of it is calming. Sudden, jerky motion excites. It's scary. It's scary. The field that you work in, uh, I can't imagine that there would be a lot of women involved in it, that it's primarily men that you have worked with. Well, there's a lot of women in it now, but when I first started, there weren't any. When I first started in animal science, they didn't, even, they didn't even have women working in the dairy milking the cows. And when I was working in animal science, I was the first woman to work in the dairy, and they said, oh, well, women couldn't work in the dairy because they couldn't pick up the milk jugs. Well, I just learned to milk the cow into the jug with the jug on a little cart, and then I didn't have to pick it up. There's a point in your book where you said you didn't know which was the bigger barrier early on in your career, whether it was being autistic or whether it was being a woman in this field. Well, being a woman in the field is a real barrier. I mean, I used to get, um, you know, just had the men do all kinds of stuff. I mean, the stuff that people call sexual discrimination now, nothing compared to some of the stuff I went through. <laughs> Well, we won't, we won't have you describe it. No, I don't really want to describe it. I really don't want to describe it. It's not proper they're, conversation. They're in the book anyway, and, uh, and people can read about it. Oliver Sacks did an interview with you not too many years ago. And he, as the title of that essay, he used a phrase that you used to describe yourself, which was you, you saw yourself sometimes as an anthropologist on Mars. Well, you see, the problem with an autistic person is you have to learn all social relates relationships with intellect. You know, I was, you know, in writing my, uh, you know, my book, Thinking in Pictures, I, uh, you know, was kind of shocked to find out just how many sort of little emotional cues people get off each other. I mean, I can tell whether a person's, you know, like laughing or whether they're crying or something like that, but the more subtle things, I don't, I don't pick up. And, and it'd be sort of like if I was to go to Mars, and I'm trying to figure out how the people up there communicate. And let's say maybe they use radio waves to communicate. I mean, I have no way of knowing that unless I accidentally tuned in my radio to, you know, to that frequency. Uh, you know, that there was sort of an electricity going on with other people that I just didn't really understand. Uh, you know, an autistic person basically does things with intellect. I really identified Mr. Spock in Star Trek because he used logic to figure things out. And one of the things that was very difficult for me to understand is, is that some professors are not very objective in evaluating somebody else's scientific work. They'll go, well, that's a really charitable paper. And they're saying that because they hated the guy, not uh -huh. because he did a bad piece of research. It's difficult for me to understand sort of the long-term seething hatreds that keep the wars going on in Bosnia and Ireland. I mean, why? Why do this? Why be blowing up the city and things like that? when there's so much other better things to do than that. It's not logical. No, it's not logical to do things like that. In reading the book, there, there were a couple of points where I got very confused, though, about, in the introduction, for example, I said that often autistic people are estranged from emotion. But there are moments in the book where you describe very deep emotions. Well, that, uh, autistic people have emotions. The, the, the difference is it's simpler. I mean, fear is one of the main emotions. I can get angry. I can be happy. Um, it's, it's there, but it's simpler. So it's more like a child's emotions. And, and I don't understand complex emotion. Like, how can somebody love somebody and be jealous at the same time? I mean, that sort of stuff, I don't, um, I just don't, you know, get that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I sort of don't get why people are so interested in it. I mean, I, to me... <laughs> Uh, the people that I get along with the best are people that, you know, that, 
you know, other engineers, technical people. I like to talk with animal people, animal training people, get along really well with them. We had some great animal trainers at the Denver Zoo. Megan Phillips, oh, she's absolutely superb at training the antelope. I, I, I like to talk to people about autism. Mm -hmm. I, you became an ambassador of sorts for autism with your first book. Well, you see, autism is misunderstood. I mean, a lot of people think it's caused by things like bad parenting. It's not true. It's been definitely absolutely proven by Margaret Bowman's autopsy research on brains done in Boston that autism is immature development of the brain that is happening during fetal development. And it's mainly in the limbic system that's involved with emotion and in the cerebellum that's involved in some sensory processing and motor control. A lot of parents suffered for a great many years of, because of theories that said, was it Bruno Bettelheim? Yeah, it was Bruno Bettelheim. And, I the mean, frigid mother. That's been completely completely discounted. The problem is the child pulls away because sound hurts, touch hurts, the, the you know sensory stimulation is just too overwhelming. Some kids have visual problems where fluorescent lighting just drives them crazy and and you pull away because the world hurts. I mean I used to do rocking and I used to dribble sand through my hands and do stereotypic kind of rocking behavior because that shut the world out. It shut a world out that was painful to my senses. But the problem is, if you let the little kids do that, their brains aren't going to develop. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of early educational intervention. I was in an excellent, in excellent programs by age two and a half. Because you need to have a lot of one-on-ones with a teacher to keep the child's brain connected with the world. You know, you've got to keep them on. And so how do you deal with the sensory stimulation that hurts? Well, you've got to protect the child from uh, microphone feedback. That's one of the worst noises. He's not going to want to go into a classroom if he knows a PA system might feed back. School bells, maybe cell phones might scare him because you never know when it's going to make a horrible noise that's going to hurt his ears. You make a few simple environmental modifications and keep noise and distractions down. You know, then the child, you'll be able to get, you know, through. For a child born today with autism, how much more sophisticated are we in the way that we treat these children? Well, good teachers did the same things with me over 45 years ago that good teachers do today. You know, in terms of the educational methods, uh, the important thing is getting enough hours per week of one-on-ones and two-on-ones. We keep the little kid, and I'm talking about the two to three-year-old little kid, actively interacting and engaged, you know, with adults and with other older children. Um, there are some thing, new things that have been learned. I mean, there are some new things medically, but I, people get way too quick to be given a lot of powerful drugs to extremely little kids. Um, medication has a much bigger part of treatment in teenagers and adults than it does in, in little kids. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of getting into a good program, and then you get into the whole diagnostic controversy. They can be called autistic or PDD, which means pervasive developmental disorder. Whether both autistic kids and PDD kids need the same early educational treatment. In a newspaper story that I read last night about autism, one of the things that was in it that said, and I'll try to be really accurate in remembering it, said the majority of people born with autism are mentally retarded, but a, but a small percentage are, are gifted and have these skills. And I wondered- That's correct. That's that correct. is correct. Autism is a very variable disorder. And about half of people with autism remain nonverbal and very severely handicapped. And there's about 10% that have normal or above normal intelligence. The Rain Man type savant would be one of the types in that category. Hmm. What kind of advice did you give Dustin Hoffman about that role? Well, Dustin Hoffman had looked at some other people with autism to see how savant acted. But what I told Dustin was what it felt like. You know, what it felt like to have noise hurt your ears like a dentist drill. Like when the school bell went off, it's like a dentist drilled down the ear. Um, that I was in a constant state of anxiety all the time. I said, Dustin, just imagine your first audition nerves, how anxious you were. Now just imagine if you were that anxious all the time for absolutely no reason. That's the way I used to feel until I started taking antidepressant medication. Hmm. And that's something that you actually went through the medical literature well, and, and found Well, I had found, found that yourself. all myself in the medical literature. Um, it's about... 17 or eight, 17 years ago now, um, I read an article in a medical journal that described uh, panic attacks and it had a whole big long list of symptoms. And I go, that sounds like me. 
and they were treating it with tricyclic um, antidepressant uh, medication. Today, there's better things now for treating it, things like Prozac and the other serotonin reuptake inhibitor drugs like uh, Zoloft and Paxil or Luvox. Um, uh, but one of the things that's very important to understand if you're using an antidepressant medication to control anxiety and panic is the dose required for treating depression is much higher than the dose required for treating anxiety. See, the way things like Prozac work is that calm down one circuit. Well, I'm going to call it the nerve and anxiety circuit. And they activate another circuit, the, you know, which, which is the circuit that would take you out of depression. But the problem is when you're dealing with a person that has anxiety, you've got to be really careful not to overdose this. See, otherwise you're going to get, on ang you're going to get insomnia, agitation, and the cure is, cure is worse you can than... get you can get these like Prozac reactions now what those are those are overdoses the trick is is you got to give just enough to calm this down without sending this off into like manic insomnia irritability land mm. you know you need to explain to people that are taking that start taking Prozac when they first start like in the first month they've got to watch very very carefully and if they start to feel like they drank 20 cups of coffee they got to <laughs> cut that dose back instantly immediately in his essay about you, Oliver Sacks mentioned some statistics about autism, mentioning that it's, it's found around the world and that the features are remarkably similar, whether it's in a culture that's very different from another. That's right. It's got a very strong genetic uh, basis to it. And it, it's a condition that's caused a great deal of pain, um, anxiety for parents, for the people who have the condition. But you write in your book that you feel there's a purpose that you believe that there's a purpose, the reason that autism continues to be found throughout well, the world. Well, you see, autism and also depression and manic depression are not black and white disorders like Down syndrome, where you have a very, very specific abnormality in the chromosomes. It's a continuum from normal to abnormal. And if you look into parents of autistic children, there's been quite a few studies done on this, you'll find oftentimes intellectual giftedness. Um, you'll find visual and associational kinds of writing styles. The traits will be there in the parents, but in a milder amount. Uh, Einstein had a lot of autistic traits. I'm not going to say he was autistic, but he had delayed speech. Um, didn't care much for you know proper hairdos for men. Um, <laughs> he did things like not wear socks. Not a snappy dresser. Which uh, <laughs> might have uh, had a sensory basis because woolen socks would have you know itched his feet and driven him absolutely crazy and it felt like sandpaper in his shoes. Um, it's, it's a continuum, you know, where maybe a little bit of some of these traits can, can provide an advantage. Too much of the trait makes a tremendous big disability. There's a, there's a doctor named Kay Redfield Jamison, and she's written extensively about depression and manic depression. And there's been a number of studies done now that have tracked uh, famous writers like Ernest Hemingway, you know, and that famous creative writers have a much higher incidence of depression. You know, so it's like a little bit of, of this can give you some advantages. You get way too much and you, you're going to be in, in a great deal of trouble. I think the, the sentence that I remember from the book is that creativity itself may be an abnormality. May, maybe it is. Maybe if we got rid of the genetics that make autism, manic depression, and depression, we'd have a perfect little world of very social, socially acceptable little accountants, and it wouldn't be a very interesting world. <laughs> One of the th things I had meant to, uh, to bring up a few minutes ago, autistic children often fixate on something. They get locked on to a subject. Your advice is, is to not, as so often happens, try to force them out of that but to try to work with that as a motivator, well, like your career has really well, ended that's up right. being. You want, let's say the kid's hung up on airplanes. Well, instead of trying to get rid of the airplane, use it to teach reading, read a book about airplanes, do mathematics with airplanes, study the history of aviation. Use that fixation, broaden it out. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of developing talents. Many autistic and dyslexic kids have great talents in drawing. We need to work on developing that talent. Another real talent area is computer programming, because these are the kind of things that can be made into careers. Because there's a lot of autistic people that get through school just fine, but then they don't get a job, because with their great personality, they don't you know, make a big impression on the personnel office. Hmm. What the autistic person needs to do is develop a portfolio of drawings, or of computer programs, or of computer graphics. Take that in there and show it to the art department or the computing department. 
and you have to sell your talent to your employer. Hmm. In talking about the, the possibly the purpose of this condition, talk to me about the purpose of your life. You seem very clear about what you want to accomplish. Well, I want to have done something of value that will, uh, you know, make the world a better place to live in. I guess, you know, what is significant for me in life? It's doing something of value. I guess a lot of people get their significance in life from their emotional relationships, but I get my significance in life from doing something of lasting value. You know, I've done a lot of work on improving humane treatment of animals. I also do doing a lot of work on improving understanding of, of autism. I mean, those are two things that are, are valuable. Uh, you know, it sort of blows my mind that so many people are like interested in power. I find in working out in industry, um, you know, like you might have a plant manager somewhere who's more interested in power than he is running his plant properly. <laughs> yes, I, we've all run across yeah. people I like mean, that. And that. That's true in every industry has got this problem. I'm sure the TV stations have got their idiots too. <laughs> One of the things that runs through this book, you mention it several times that, that I didn't quite get in terms of why it was happening. The phrase over and over, until a few years ago, until very recently, it was as though within the last two or three years, you've gone through another of the many doors that you described. Well, you see, book. it's a gradual development. People are always looking for the single magic cure breakthrough. There wasn't any. It was a whole lot of things, starting out with getting into good early invention, mother teaching me to read, good teachers, helpful employers. But in writing my book, Thinking in Pictures, I, I, um, I learned, learned more about, you know, that other people that have visual thinking don't have visual thinking that is, that is, that is specific as mine. Um, I found out that other people get all these emotional, little subtle emotional signals off each other. Uh -huh. You see, and I didn't really find these things out until I started actually interviewing people about how they think and how they feel. You've been asked if you could snap your fingers and, and not be autistic. Would you do that? Well, I wouldn't want to lose my visualization skill. I just don't know what it would be like to, to not have the pictures in my imagination. Mm. And you've always said that it's who you are. Yeah, that's right. Temple Grandin, I, the book is wonderful, Thinking oh, in Pictures. Hold it up so they can see it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Thank you again okay. for being a guest on Upon Reflection. OK. Thank Thanks you for evening. having me. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.